the ice and the long moonlit polar nights with all their yearning seemed like a far off dream from another world. A dream that had come and passed away. But what would life be worth without its dreams? We are in the gallery of the Lightcatcher Building at the Watka Museum. We're looking at Vanishing Ice, Alpine and Polar Landscapes in Art, 1775 to 2012. Vanishing Ice features 90 works of art from around the world. 12 countries are represented. And when somebody comes to the gallery, they will see the incredible variety of works on view. There are rare expedition journals that were illustrated by artist explorers. There are sketchbooks paintings, black and white and color photography, film, installation. What's interesting is that you can trace the history of artists' interaction with glaciers and icebergs through the different media. And so what I did is I selected the most beautiful images that also reflect the importance of artists in introducing these regions to the world. So in the 18th and 19th centuries, artists and scientists awakened the world to these regions where people for the first time learned about the geography. Now, with climate change in the background, artists are once again going to these regions to alert people to what's happening with climate change. And from the point of view of American history, it's significant because uh, there are survey expeditions that took place and artists were part of that. And the whole movement for national park creation was in some ways a result of artists going out with scientists and bringing back images that blew people's minds. And people were just overwhelmed by the beauty, but at the same time, they opened up the country for development. And so it was a double-edged sword. The wilderness, but then the development of the wilderness happening side by side. When you enter the exhibition, you'll confront Albert Bierstadt, Sir Mount MacDonald, and it was painted in 1890. Albert Bierstadt is known as the premier painter of the American West. He came to this area of the world in 1857 as part of Frederick Lander's survey expedition. And he returned in 1863 and was one of the first people, white people, to see Yosemite National Park and painted many views of Yosemite. And in 1889, he came to the Pacific Northwest. He painted views of Mount Baker, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, and some of the best and most well-known peaks of the Canadian Rockies. This introduced the American West to Easterners. And what was interesting is that many of his trips were sponsored by the Union Pacific Railway. The reason being, they realized that the paintings that he would come back with would introduce wealthy Americans in New York City in particular to the region, encourage them to come west, as well as invest in the further line of the railway. Displayed next to Albert Bierstadt, Sir Mount MacDonald, is Thomas Hart Benton's Trail Riders, which was created in 1964-65. This painting is autobiographical. It documents a trip that he made on horseback with his friend in 1964. Thomas Hart Benton was the grandnephew of Senator Benton, who was a popular senator from Missouri. And he formulated important policies about manifest destiny, the idea that Americans were destined to expand towards the Pacific Ocean and occupy the whole continent. And so Benton, even though this work is autobiographical, is also making a statement uh, many, many years later about the pathfinders and the trailblazers who opened up the West to expansionism. This comparison is one of many in the exhibition where early works are compared to later images so that people could visualize the recession of the glaciers. These are three images of Coleman Glacier on Mount Baker. 
This is the Elliott Porter photograph of Coleman Glacier on Mount Baker, dated 1975. This view is compared in the exhibition to a photograph by Brett Bounton, who is a Bellingham-based photographer. You can see by the comparison between the two photographers, the retreat of Coleman Glacier. And in general, the retreat of glaciers in the North Cascades has been about 20% over the time period of 1975 and 2007. Above is a earlier work by Henry Engberg, an amateur photographer. This was taken in 1910 approximately, and you can see how people in the community would very often hike up to the glacier, which they still can do, and it's a very popular hike outside of Bellingham. It's one thing to read that so-and-so glacier has retreated 400 feet from the period of time of 1975 to the present, but it's another to actually see images side by side. And in fact, many scientists are looking at early artworks, in particular in the Alpine regions, to compare with contemporary works, sometimes their own photographs, so that it's uh, very valuable uh, from the scientific point of view, as well as introducing the public uh, to what is happening in a very visceral way. This is a photograph of the Greenland ice sheet by a German artist, Olaf Otto Becker, dating from 2008. And it's exhibited side by side with a photograph by Camille Seaman, also of East Greenland, it's from her last iceberg series of 2006, followed by a photograph by Tina Itkonen, a Finlandish artist who went up to a really small town in Greenland, Umanak, and photographed the landscape and the people there. We move to Subankar Banerjee's photograph of the caribou migration that was taken in 2002 in conjunction with a book that he wrote showing many photographs called The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Seasons of Life and Land. This is a view from a plane of the migration and caribou crossing a frozen river. The difference between people looking at works of art and understanding about climate change and the information provided by scientists is that you don't receive a gut reaction when you read something. But when you come into a gallery and you see the beauty of these works, you will have a emotional, a spiritual connection to these regions. And by doing that, the hope is that people will then start thinking about climate change in a new way through the lens of art and how important it is for culture as well as nature. And then people might think about ways that they personally can do something policy-wise or personally so that we can preserve these regions as well as uh, the legacy um, of ice. Mm -hmm.